have the privilege of co-leading the church with my dad. It's kind of fun. Um, and we get to be here on a regular basis, helping other people find Jesus. And that's what we're excited about doing at Cap City Church, is making sure that in all areas of our life, that Jesus is the Lord. And so this morning, uh, after after an amazing retreat like we had, and we may refer refer to that a few times today. And if you if you're new or if you didn't go, uh, and know that it was it was an exciting moment that we could just meet with God. And uh, and part of this, we said this morning, what what would the Lord uh, want us to speak on? What would He want us to teach on? How how would He want to encourage the body this morning? And so we said, man, why don't we talk about vision? Where are we going? What does God want to do here at Cap City Church? What does God want to do in the world? And it's a, it's a perfect part of, uh, place to start. It's to start with the gospel of what Jesus has done, who he is, and, and from there, then we get the catapult into where we're going and what God wants us to do. Because apart from what Jesus did, uh, we don't want to get, we want to do anything other than what Jesus did. Uh, we don't want to be anything that Jesus didn't, uh, Jesus wasn't. Uh, we don't want to do anything that, that he wouldn't do because Jesus came to glorify the Father, to show the world how great and how awesome his Father is. And, and that's why we're here. That's why we exist. And so this morning, I want to pray over the message before we get started and just ask God to say, hey, God, would you uh, bring to light scriptures in our lives in ways that we can act and be more like Jesus? Amen? Good prayer? Let's pray. God, you are good. Yes. We thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for your word. And God, we thank you that it's something that it can encourage us and it can instruct us, Father Lord, and even corrects us. So, Father Lord, if any of those areas happen today, God, I pray that in our hearts we would say yes and amen. We would say yes to whatever you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, Jesus, who, who is Jesus? Uh, this morning we get to talk all about his name, that he has a beautiful name, he has a powerful name, and he has, a, he has the power to change lives, right? And all of this comes through one thing, one purpose, one goal that the Father had for him was that you and I, that the world around us, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, our family members, will be reunited with him. And I love the, the story of the Bible, and we reference this a lot here at Capital City Church, that at the beginning of time, when God created Adam and Eve, and he was in the garden, and they had fellowship with him, and there was, there was perfect peace, there was, there was perfect heaven, it was, it was heaven on earth. And when Jesus taught us to pray in the, in the New Testament, he he taught us this way, that we would pray, God, would you bring heaven on earth? So we see throughout the whole story of God, from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, that God is constantly bringing restoration. He's brought, constantly bringing his character, who he is, to bear into history. And so Jesus does this in a powerful way. So we always say around here at Capital City Church, we say, we're a multicultural family of servant missionaries sent to make disciples. Because we see the life of Jesus and we said, man, if, if anything encapsulates Jesus' ministry here on earth, man, it was for all nations, for all people, from every creed, from any color, from every, any sex, whoever you are, it was for his kingdom, right? And we want to be a family of servant missionaries. Today we're going to break down that. What, what do we mean by that? Where do we get that from in Scripture? Mark chapter one, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 11, verse 17, is a, is a powerful place that we start when we're saying, Hey, God, what, what do you want us to look like? Uh, where do you want us to go? What, what do you want ministry, your church, to look like here on earth? So Mark chapter 11 and, and starting in verse 17 this morning, it says this. Jesus is with his disciples. He's going to go into the, into the temple. And he, this is one of the few spots we find. And Jesus gets a little bit upset. I said, okay, cool. That, that's all right. I can identify with Jesus every once in a while. I get upset. But it was an important reason. There's more than just Jesus showing emotion here. There was a, there's a real reason why he was offended by this. So in Mark chapter 11 verse 17 it says this and as he taught them he said it is written my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations but you have made it a den of robbers 
And if we study a little bit of this passage, Jesus comes into the temple, and it's a place where people would come to, and, and there's a designated place that all nations, all people groups could come. So there was the Jewish nation, and they had a, a place in the temple that they could worship, and there's a, a, another place in the court that was meant for all nations, for anybody to come and be able to, to worship and, and serve God, and, and there was a designated place that a, actually from the very beginning was initiated into the temple. That even if you were from another nation or another people group, you could come to the temple and worship, and there was a designated place for it. And he was upset because in this place, instead of it being a place that was set up for worship, was set up for prayer, for everybody, any any creed, any person to come, and they they had tables there of, of people, and they were and they were um, selling uh, selling things to be sacrificed. But they were overcharging. They were they were, uh, there was exchange rates that they had inflated and all sorts of things. It was hindering people from worshiping from every nation. And so Jesus established again, my ministry is going to be about everybody in one place worshiping God. And it's a beautiful picture. We go to the book of Revelation, we go to the end of the book, not, and, and I'm just going to, I want to reference a few scriptures, but and I challenge you to go through all, all, of, all of the story, and if you want, we can come together, on, even on our website, we have a bunch of scriptures on there, uh, of all these different instances throughout the Old Testament, where God's saying, all people, all people, all people. And then we finally get to the crescendo of it all, revelations, people before the throne room of God, and, and, and it says what? Every tongue, every tribe, and every nation, worshiping the Father. And so, man, when we said, making a vision for Path City Church, we said, you know, uh, we hear stats about Sunday morning being the most segregated hour in the uh, hour in the country. Uh, I don't know if you've ever ever heard that before, uh, but it, it tends to be that hey, uh, we like oh we like and we go that way. But we said no, we need to be a church that represents and reflects God's kingdom, all of the uniqueness of who He is. Man, reflect that as we celebrate on Sunday morning. In the music we play, we're, we want to be able to express all different types of cultures. We have, uh, we have, in the instrumentalists that we have, and everything of that nature, we said, man, let it, let it sound, let it look like that picture that we see in heaven. Because again, Jesus said, I want to bring heaven to earth. I want to bring that kind of unity. I want to bring that kind of togetherness. Because there's a purpose for it, and that's what we're going to get into, is the purpose. Why is it that, 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 that he wants all people equal? Why, why is, it, is it that he says it's for all nations? Man, it's because it's going to be a purpose for his glory to be shown everywhere. Man, if you think about that alone, his glory, what, what, would it, what would it exemplify if all of us were to come together uh, under one roof uh, for one mission and for one purpose? And it's unity that, that isn't shown anywhere else. Right? It, it shows a one, it shows a love, there's, a, there's an adoration for one another. That, and even in our differences, man, we, we can love and come together and worship the one Father in heaven. And to the world that they see how great and how awesome God is. Because oftentimes, man, in my living room, I'll have a game night, and there'd be people from all different corners of the world, and we're all together playing a game and having fun. And I've had people comment, man. There's nowhere else that, that I can experience this kind of uh, like fellowship or this kind of uh, like, um, peace and joy and unity with all of us from all over the world and all different things. And, and I think it's only because of Jesus Amen. that we can come together. He is a common thread that's through all generations, through all stories. And so that's why we say, first of all, foremost, man, we are multicultural and we want to be that. We're, we're gearing towards that. We're working towards that. We say we can get better at it. Everybody... We can get better at it, too. Uh, but that's where we're going. That's the vision that God has given us as a church. But let's look here. Um, Matthew chapter 28. This is, the, this is the crutch. This is the core of what we do. Matthew chapter 28. And this is a, maybe a familiar pastor, a passage for us. And that's okay. But even in familiar passages, God can bring to light something and can correct us, encourage us uh, in, in the scripture, Right? So Matthew chapter 28, the words of Jesus, again bringing up the nations, I love it. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely... 
I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Last words, Jesus. Man, this is really important. We're together, and I'm going to decree that you're going to go forth, and all nations, all people groups are going to be impacted by this message. The message that Jesus Christ is Lord over all things, Amen. that he's come to restore and, and repair all brokenness. Amen. We've talked a lot about that over the weekend, and I want to emphasize that at this moment, that that sin, the, the brokenness that we see around us, is an effect of sin. Like, like anything that you can think of right now, whether it be about your personal life, uh, the neighborhood that you're living in, the family, any, any, look at anything and you say, ah, oh, this is not right. I'm pretty positive, I can stand pretty firmly and say, that, that's an effect of sin. Whether it was uh, healing that's needed, broken relationships, a hatred, uh, grief, uh, mourning, uh, sack, anything that is not like God is an effect of sin. And Jesus came to restore this. And that's the hope that we have. That's the, that's the thing that he came to do. Jesus came to restore so that we can be back in the place where us and the Father are one. And we have a perfect relationship. The effects of sin no longer uh, do we have to deal with. So back to Matthew chapter 20, all authority in heaven, go and make disciples of all nations. Again, that emphasis on, man, all people groups. We want to look like that. That's where we want to go. But specifically, we say we are a family of servant missionaries. So we're going to go into that today. What, where does that come from? And it comes right here from Matthew 28. It says specifically here that, that we should be baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is, a, this is a powerful uh, statement that oftentimes during a water baptism, that's, that's something we say, man, we're gonna, when we water baptize something, we're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Man, they're gonna, when they go into the water, just like Romans says, they're going to die and, and they're going to come to life in Christ, right? But here also is a powerful identity statement for each one of us. That we should be baptizing us into the identity of the Father, into our identity of the Son, and the identity of the Holy Spirit. And this is where we get these statements that we are a family of, of uh, sorry, we're a family of servant missionaries. Because the Father, if, if, the, if, if God is our Father, and Romans says that if we are in Christ and, and His Spirit is in us, then we get to call our Heavenly Father Father. We get to call him Abba, Daddy. Uh, and, and so now, in Christ, we are all his sons, and we are all his daughters. And all in this group, we are all his family. And so it, it is not just a statement of, of vision for us, but it also a statement of action for us. So if we are all family in this room, then it predicates, it, it predicates um, an action that we show towards one another. If Jesus is the one that sits on the throne, but he didn't just sit on the throne, right? He came and he served us, even to the point of death. Man, when we're baptized into the identity of Jesus, now we also take on that servant identity, and now, and no matter what the need is around us, no matter whether it is my brother or my foe, now all of a sudden, no, I'm at a place of serving. Jesus makes a powerful statement we're going to look at about his purpose on earth. It wasn't just conquering death and, and setting up kingdoms and, and overthrowing governments. No, he came, he came to serve. And the Holy Spirit plays a powerful role in our life, according to uh, John chapter 17, and that he is the one that speaks truth. And over and over it says that the Holy Spirit is the one that leads us. And, and if we can't actually come to know Jesus as our Savior unless the Holy Spirit does His work. Unless the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and our righteousness. So now, I, you, each one of us, if we've been baptized into that identity, if we take on the identity of the Holy Spirit, think about it, our role, our opportunity in life is to be just like the Holy Spirit. That we be ones that speak truth and illuminate people's hearts by the things that we say and, and encouraging one another to grow up into truth. Now we know we can't do any of that without the Spirit's help, 
but that is the role that we have to serve. So let's look, as, as we look at both, all three of those identities, we're going to go through some scripture and say, God, show us this. Because, hey, if, if, I'm, if I'm not who I'm supposed to be, if I'm not living like I'm supposed to be, then this whole thing actually doesn't get to go forth. We play a part, I don't know if you know this, I'll let you guys know a few times today, we play a major part in God restoring the world. Yeah. Amen. And if anything, I want you guys to get that, that, yeah, Andrew, these aren't just words that we have on our website or words that we put on our, our pieces of paper or on the, on the board. No, these are like action statements. Man. These, are, these are identity statements. Man. No, this is like, this is for me. There's a few people like, smile. some people are tired this morning. I get it. <laughs> I, I get excited when I think about that God is reconciling the world to himself and I get to play a part in it. Yes. I get to show other people who God is. I get to, when I serve somebody, I'm not just doing something sweet for them. I'm not just being a nice guy. No, I'm like, I'm like the hands of Jesus. You're like the hands of Jesus serving people, right? When I put other people's needs above my own, man, I'm, I'm taking on the identity of Jesus. I'm showing somebody who Christ is. Man, when I get an opportunity to share my faith and somebody at work is going through something and I'm able to share with them a truth about Jesus that encourages their heart and lifts them up, man, I, I'm actually like taking on the identity of the Holy Spirit revealing who Jesus is. When you do this to your, to your sibling, to your spouse, to your children, to your coworker, I mean, you're saying thing. You're taking on that identity. You're saying, no, I, in this moment, I'm speaking truth. I'm taking on the identity of the Holy Spirit. Man, when I love people, and when you love people with unconditional love, it's a demonstration. Now, I'm taking part in God's kingdom being established, a kingdom that is full of love, not of hate and rebellion and brokenness, but it's one that says, no matter what your need is, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to meet it, I love you. Amen. Right? Like, like, it's a little bit exciting. That's right. It's a, it's like there's more to this than just coming on a Sunday morning, and, and worshiping and, and, and reading the word. You know, it, it's more than just praying and, and getting myself right. I love that. God, show me who I am. But there's, there's something he wants us to do. Help him restore the world. Amen. So let's look at this together. Since God is our Father, we are family. We are the children of God who care for each other like family. We are God's chosen people. We are His family, again, set apart to live in such a way that the world would know what He's like. So they should look at the way that, that Linda goes, and she, Linda's an awesome, loving person, goes and picks up people and helps them get to church and, and, and goes and picks up groceries and doing do things. Man, the way that she, Linda, loves people, the, the world can look at it and say, wow, that's a picture of who God is, what He's like in the world. Through faith in Jesus, we believe that we are the children, the brothers and sisters with one another. What's really cool is that with Jesus, when we come before Jesus and we take him as the Lord of our life, we actually become like co-heirs with Christ. You know, that's like, that's like not like subservient, like, like our, we have an equal authority, we have equal inheritance with Christ. What is this? So now when we express the love for one another, man, it comes from a place that, whoa, I have everything, and now I can give it all away. In John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. The powerful statement introducing who Jesus is in John, one of my favorite gospels, is also, John is also an action-packed, uh, gospel showing miracles and wonders and so in John chapter 1 we see this powerful statement about who we are when we submit our lives to Jesus when Jesus becomes Lord of our lives all of a sudden boom John chapter 1 verse 12 yet to all who did receive him it talks before about those who reject him I'm, I'm praying that all of us in the, this room believe this morning that all of us in the room have not rejected Christ Yet to all those who did receive them, to those who believe in the name of Jesus, he gave them the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or the will of a husband, but born of God. 
God ordains us to be a part of his family, us to be a part of his love. Then Romans 8, I mentioned this before, the scripture is Romans 8, chapter, uh, verses 14 to 17, that the Spirit of God, now that we have come before Christ, we've made him Lord, the Spirit of God allows us to say, Abba, Father. So that changes me. So, right? So if, if the Father in heaven has done these things for us, he has come to us and said, man, I love you unconditionally. You are mine. You are my child. And now, all of a sudden, instead of the feeling of rejection or, or any other, other things or, or ways that we've felt unloved in our life, now it's replaced with the love of the Father who unconditionally loves us, who calls us his child no matter what. The Bible says in Romans that we were actually his enemies. When he showed us this love. So now that we've received this great love, we reciprocate it over and over and over again, right? The amazing thing about God is he doesn't ask us to do something he hasn't already done himself. As God's family, we see it as our obligation and opportunity to care personally for the needs of one another, both physically and spiritually. That's what we believe as a church. Because that's the way God's love was shown towards us. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4. And this is a little lengthy of a, of a scripture, but man, it is like so full of truth of what God has done for us, and now the reciprocal of that, that we do to others. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. And it says this, Dear friends, I love Paul. Paul's so sincere. Or John and, and Paul and all the writers. And so sincere. Dear friends, dear brothers, dear sisters. It's like, hey, come close. Get this. Let's love one another. For the love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Mm -hmm. He's like the ultimate example of putting others' needs above himself. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Man, we want to be about the business of loving one another. And so, through Cap City Church, we have uh, missional communities that meet one on Wednesday night in Middleton, one on Friday nights here uh, near Sheboygan Avenue. And man, we, we want to know each other. We, it's really hard on a Sunday morning when we just say hello or greet one another to really know where our physical and spiritual needs are. So it, it requires maybe coming to a, a nightly meeting, or maybe, hey, coming and get coffee together, or, or meeting over meals, or things of that nature, so that we can know one another, so we can actually know how, how do I show love? How do I show love to Angel, Brother Angel? How, how, do, how, how do I do that? I gotta, I gotta know one another. I gotta know each other intimately. And that's how the Father knows us. He knew intimately our need was that we would be together in His family, united in His love. And now we, in that love, can now say, Man, I, I know how to love Bobby because Christ did it for me. Christ unconditionally, at any expense, paid the price for me. And so now we say, as a church, we say we are a family because we want to show that unconditional love for one another. But if this, truth, if this is true, that we, when we come to Christ, become the sons and daughters of God, then everybody around me is now my potential brothers and sisters. I don't know how you grew up if your home was like, you know, you, you didn't really enjoy your brothers and sisters. Yeah. I got I got a, a brother seven years younger than me. I know we had we had some moments growing up, right? So maybe maybe it's a bad example. But I think about what, what would be the best what is the best example of what it would be like to have a relationship with a brother and a sister? I mean, boom, we should be treating others like that because there are potential brothers and sisters out there. There are annoying neighbor who stays up late and he and he does loud music and it's crazy and he's always having noises and it, it's all messed up. Anybody get annoyed at, at people that don't know Jesus? I get annoyed at sometimes with people that know Jesus. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, right? But, but sometimes, you know, people are in their sin, and it's like, ah! Oh! You know, that's, that's the same way.
way that we were to Christ before we came to Him. That's right. The scripture says we're just like filthy rags. We, that is, we were just as annoying in our sins to Christ. But he overlooked that and he said, you know what? Unconditionally, I'm going to love and I'm going to serve you. And now, now I've become the son. You've become the son or the daughter of God. We are family. And that's what we want to grow into too as a church. Say, Man, that's the goal. That we would look like we have unconditional love for one another and unconditional love for our neighbors and our co-workers. And that together we'll see the love of And through that, Others will see, and we will see the love of the Father. We'll see Him glorified. We'll think, wow, God, you're like around us as we all become one. <clears throat> all right? We, we are family because we're the children of God, and so we treat others like family. And secondly, we, we say all the time that we are servants. Why is that? Because Jesus set up a kingdom that's so unlike this world. Right? And think about any, any kingdom that you have. How do you gain power as a king? Got to conquer more. You got to take more. The more people you got, the more land you got, the more awards you win, the more and you get more accolades. Well, Jesus shows up on the scene, and he already has all of that. Yeah. Right. He already has the throne in heaven. He already already has the name of all names. He already has all the power and all the riches and all the glory. He he, he has it all. So when he comes and establishes his kingdom, what does he what does he do? He says, I I came not to be served. Not for you to come and give me everything you've got, and, and not for me to for you to come and use all of it, for me to gain the, the benefit of all your gifts. I, I already have everything. I've come in the security of who I am to serve you. Amen. Amen. To serve you. And so now, what are we become? Who are we? Man, we're God's servant. We're a servant. Man, we, we should be, and God help us, right? We should be the most humble people to say, wow, God, you served me with your riches and all of who you are. You, you actually made me a co-heir with you and, and gave me your inheritance. I actually, my future is already secure. So nothing that, so think about that. If we really believe this and we really got this inside of us, no, no serving opportunity is too great for us because we have nothing to lose, right? We're already secure in Christ. That's how Christ... Christ knew he had nothing to lose. He was one with God. God was his father. It, it was already all secure. It was all, already all good. So when he came and served, and when they spat on his face, and he, they spoke things against him, he didn't have to defend himself because he was already secure in it. Yeah. He could just serve even, the verse says, even to the point of death. Now what it, would it be like if we as his children also get that kind of security of what we have in him, so when we see needs that arise among us, it doesn't matter what people are going to say about us. It doesn't matter if it doesn't come out the right way. It doesn't matter if it even ends up with their salvation. It's just that there's a need. I'm going to meet it because I know what I have. I know who I am, and it doesn't affect me what you think about me. I just, I'm just here to serve you. Oh, Jesus, you just... Sometimes I look at Jesus, I look at Jesus all the time, I'm like, man, you're so good. Like, I, I need some of that. I, yeah. <laughs> change my heart, God. I need I, I, I to be like you. Yes. Fully God and fully human, Jesus took on the posture of the servant. He gave his life, even to the point of death, so that others could experience salvation, restoration, and peace. What if it made our mission? And this is, our, this is our mission as a church. This is what we're doing, okay? We're going to this place that our mission is that no matter what, I'm going to help bring restoration around me. And I see brokenness around me, and God, what can I do to be a part of making that right? What can I do to help bring peace to my family? What can I do to help bring peace to my neighborhood? God, some of us may be saying, like we had the retreat, Jesus, I need that peace. Come, Jesus, would you come serve me and, and make things right in my life? Jesus said, I am, among, I am among you as one who serves. All those who follow Jesus are called to serve in that same kind of humility. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 through 28, Jesus makes that powerful statement. I came, I came to serve and not to be served. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, we're going to go there because this is a powerful statement about Christ.
Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. This statement about Christ, it's like the perfect picture of Him, says this, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ. This is a current encouragement for Christ. In, in, the, in your relationship, have the same mindset as Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and found in his appearance a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Yeah. A man. And it, so when we get this, when we get this servant identity identity thing right. We serve God. God, no matter what you ask me, I've got it. I'm obedient to you. Hey, I still need work on that. God, whatever you ask of me, I'm obedient to you. It's a crazy scripture. In 1 Peter 2, 16, it says that we should that we are free, that we shouldn't use our freedom for ourselves, but we should actually live as slaves to God. And this, this weird paradox here that we're free, but yet we live, we submit ourselves fully to God and say, God, whatever you want, I'm obedient to you. So we're free in the fact that we have sin has no control over us, but yet we then uh, um, we then choose to submit ourselves underneath God's authority and say, God, whatever you want, I'm obedient to you. Jesus did the same thing in saying, God, whatever it costs, Father, whatever it costs, I'm serving even to the point of death because, hey, we needed a Savior, we needed somebody to take our place because of the penalty of the sense of penalty of our own ways was death. Man, Jesus, thank you. Yeah. Thank you that you serve me. And so it's with that attitude I serve him. And it's with that attitude and that, that mindset that we get to serve one another and we get to serve those who are outside of the, outside of the kingdom of God. We say, wow, whatever it costs, I'll do it. Take on that attitude of Christ. Have that same mindset. Be a servant. We are a family of servants. Yeah. Serving the Lord and serving others. And thirdly, we are missionaries. We are missionaries. You're a missionary. I'm a missionary. Right? No, oh, I've never been overseas. It's, it's alright. We've got to redefine it. We've got to redefine some things. Right? We, we, you know, I grew up I grew up in the church and we had missionaries come from, I loved it when we had like South America, South African uh, general, Ian Stomp and his dad would come, you know, and they came to our church. And I would love hearing stories of missionaries and, and all the different cool things they did. And, and you know, I, one of these challenging moments for me was when I knew God had called me to speak to nation. I was like thinking about it, it was going to be all overseas. And then Rachel and I end up at Purdue University where all of the nations of the world had come to us, actually. It was really awesome. It was like one in four students were outside the U.S. And God started shifting my paradigm to think, no, actually, everywhere I go, whether it's work or home or neighborhood, uh, I'm a missionary. Why? Because we take on the identity of the Holy Spirit. When we're baptized into Him, now all of a sudden we become that truth speakers. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Uh, look at John chapter 17 and read that for yourselves. John chapter 17 said, the Holy Spirit come and he, and Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit, that he's going to say things to us and speak things to us that, that Jesus couldn't, it wasn't, it wasn't even time for Jesus to say. But he's going to lead us into what? Into all truth. So when we take on that identity as missionaries, not only is it an opportunity for us to speak all truth, and we talk about to the unbeliever, I say, yeah, I want to, I want to take on that identity. We're going to read the one verse out of this one that we're going to read is Second Corinthians chapter five. But the not only do I speak the truth to the unbeliever, but I also get to speak the truth to my brothers and sisters here in the room. Yeah. Somebody, somebody's going through something. Somebody's struggling with something. Wow, I, God wants to use my voice to speak truth into them. I've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm in one with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is in me, and He wants to use my tongue and my lips to speak truth and encourage one another. No, we really believe in discipleship. That that decree, that decree by Jesus in Matthew 28, 
wasn't just for the 12 apostles standing there. But you know what? The reason why we can sit here this morning uh, underneath the influence of the Holy Spirit and, and, and loving God and serving the Son and in the family of God is because somebody was obedient to tell somebody else, to tell somebody else, and to tell somebody else, and to speak the truth to them. And then on, on, and on down the road, we're here this morning because somebody chose to speak truth to us. Yes. Right? Yes. And so now, Jesus has this principle, right? Freely you have received, freely give away. As a part of Cap City Church, we believe that you also are here to make disciples. It's not just the job of a pastor, a, a title that I've received, now I get to be the great disciple maker. No, uh, you also have the truth. That's right. You actually have the same Holy Spirit that's in me. That's no different, right? right? Yeah. We get to speak truth. We are, this is what we say, we're missionaries. We are sent ones empowered by the Spirit to show and share Jesus to others. That's who we are. Then maybe, maybe we have some growing to do. Yeah. But that's who we are. Yeah. Because we've been baptized into the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's look here at that. My, my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures is one that gives me, oh, there's so many that get me excited. You guys know that. But 2 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 5, it, it, it gets this whole picture, wraps up this whole picture for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 16. Talking about this, right before then, Paul is talking about the work of the work of Christ, that the love of God, it compels us to go and to minister to other people, to speak truth to other people. And so this, verse 16, and because we have received this great love, and because God has, is Lord in our life, because Jesus has, has become the, the top thing in our life, so, verse 16, from now on, we regard no one from the worldly point of view. This is really important. We regard no one from the worldly point of view. We make no judgments of other people. We make, you know, we, we understand we were once like that. We once were a far away. We once were apart from God, right? Now we are with the men. So now when I think about those outside of, outside of the family of God, I, I don't view them like the world, but I wouldn't categorize them as the world. No, I see them as, no, they need Jesus, right? Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we no longer do so. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. I love that. God's doing the work. He's out there reconciling the world to himself. He, he's, right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to people yeah. and convicting them of sin. and right, he's, he's convicting us this morning too, yeah. right? That God was reconciling the world, in verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That we might look like the glory of God. That we might look like Christ himself. God has reconciled the world to himself. And we're right there, smack dab in the middle of his plan to do something. That's what he's doing through us. That's how he's changing us. More and more into his glory. So this morning, it's, it's exciting, it's an exciting time for us to say, God, what do you, how do you want me to play a part in this? God, where are the areas of my life that I can fit in? Some, some of us this morning needed that reminder, God, I, I'm loved. Thank you, God, for, for reminding me how unconditional your love is for me. And then uh, some on the other side are thinking, man, God, you're challenging me a little bit to love my neighbor as, my, as myself, to, to love like, like you love me unconditionally. And yeah, that's a little challenging to me. That's a little... You know, some of us needs to be reminded this morning that Jesus served you. <laughs> Even to the point that at any cost, he's for you, he'll do anything for you, he's cheering you on, he's serving you. But some of us also might be challenged by the thought of, man, who, who have I served lately? And do I have a hard time 
with that attitude that Christ had that, man, when I see an opportunity to serve, that's usually the last thing that I think about. And maybe God is challenging us this morning to step up, to serve like Christ served. Amen. Or maybe to not step up, but get low and serve like Christ served, yeah. right? And the last one here, that we are missionaries, that God's speaking truth to us. Receive that truth. And maybe you've never heard until this morning that God wants you to be a part of His great mission. But it is so true throughout Scripture, we see He loves using individuals, not people with pastoral cloaks or big names or titles in their name. He just uses ordinary people to speak for Him, to do His works. And that's the invitation that you have this morning, to get in the game. Get in what God's doing. So I wanted to share with you guys again, and the purpose of this is to say, this is where we're going as a church. And we know, okay, we're aware, we can get better at these things. We can get better at being an expression, a multicultural expression of God's kingdom. We can get better at share, showing love to one another. I mean, yeah? yeah? I can get better at that. I can get better at serving. I, I can get better at speaking truth when the Holy Spirit gives me those moments. But all of this is, is possible with Christ. And so we've talked a lot about this weekend. The best position to get in is a position of humility. God resists the proud, those who think they got it all in order, those who think they, they can do it. But He loves to give grace to the humble. He loves to influence those that recognize their need. And so this morning, I want to invite you to, to stand. And so in closing, we're going to pray. But I want to invite you to stand. And, 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 and think, as we're standing, we're thinking, God, what are, what are you challenging me with? Uh, what are some areas that I need to show love? You know? We're going to, we can go through these, these messages more, give some practical steps. But I believe you guys are pretty... You guys got things together. You know how to love one another. Yeah. You know what it would look like to love one another, right? And phone calls with one another. You can call somebody in a little while and show some love, right? Meet, meet somebody's need. Take somebody out to lunch today, get to know them. You're my brother, you're my sister. Right? What would it look like to serve one another? I think you guys know. You know, you know some needs that are around you. You say, all right, God, I'm in. I'm in, God, I can serve that. I, I can do that for you. God, I can take that lowly position for you. Right? I just mentioned in the church, hey, we, there's some needs here in the church on Sunday mornings. I don't know how many of you guys came to the door this morning and actually got greeted. I would love there to be greeters every Sunday morning that said, hey, welcome to church, right? The, the kids downstairs, there's some places to serve. I don't know if anybody else can sing and play the drum. I mean, there's some places to serve, right? Not just in the church, outside the church too. Right? Like, there's, you talk about God, opportunities to speak truth. We all know those moments when the Spirit prompts us to talk about Him with others. And, and God, we, we can improve on that, right? We, we know some people that need some truth around us. We, we know some people that need some encouragement, right? Yeah, I know we do. I know. This morning, with our hearts bowed before the Lord, and maybe even our eyes closed so we can concentrate on God. And, and this morning, you're prompted in your heart to do your part. You're prompted right now to say, yeah, God, I want to I wanna participate. Yeah, I want to receive your love. God, yeah, I want to show your love. Yeah, God, I want to receive this servant identity, yes, God, I know there's people that I need to serve. <laughs> Maybe you're saying in your heart, you're prompted to say, yeah, I need to speak some truth to those who are around me that I can encourage them to follow Jesus. That's just when you're just prompted, you're like, yes, I, I want to participate in this. Yeah, I want to be my identities in the world. I want to be a family. I want to be a servant. I want to be a missionary. If that's you this morning. I want you to just raise your hand saying, yes, God, I, I know I'm prompted, and yes, God, I want to follow you. I want to I wanna follow them in obedience in these things. I want to follow obedience in showing love. I want to follow obedience in serving. I want to follow obedience in sharing the truth. That's you. Just raise your hands before the Lord. Say, yes, God, that, that's me. Yeah, I'm prompted this morning. I'm challenged this morning, and I accept that challenge. Yeah.
this morning, I want to pray over you. I want to pray over you a blessing. Because we know the vision that God has given us as a church is not our own, it's to accomplish what His purposes are. And that requires some influence from God. Prerequisite is that God would influence our life so much so that our actions would change towards one another in this room and towards those who don't know Him. So I want to pray over you right now. And after I'm done praying, I challenge you to take some time and pray. Seek God and say, God, help me in this area. Show me how I can change my life that I can look like you and, and take on these identities that you have. But after I pray, you're, you're dismissed. You can do, you can pray, you can go, but I just want to pray a blessing over you. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are our Father. That we can call you by the Spirit inside of us, Abba, Father. And God, we're challenged this morning to show the same unconditional love you showed us towards one another. Father, Lord, I pray that you would empower these people, my brothers and sisters, Father, to show love unconditionally. God, that there would be such love in this room for one another. Father, such love in this family for one another. God, that the world will look at us and wonder, what's that about? What is different about us? God, I pray now for us in our servant identity. Jesus, you are so amazing. I can't even imagine sitting on a throne, having everything secure, and losing it, taking the position of the lowliest thing, dying on the cross for our place. Jesus, we thank you for that. We thank you that you served us. And Father, we ask now, God, we humble ourselves and say, God, help us to serve like Jesus served. Help us to have that mindset that, that Father, equality is not something to be used, uh, equality with God is not something to be used to our own advantage. Father, what we have is not our own. It's for the sake of serving others. God, help us to have that mindset. Change our hearts, God, that we could serve like you. And Holy Spirit, you are so precious to us, revealing truth, convicting us leading us into all, all ways of godliness. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are constantly talking to us. God, I bless your people now with ears to hear, Father, the Spirit's promptings. And God, I pray now that we would be empowered by your Spirit to speak truth. Father, for every individual, God, may we have the boldness that we need. Father, may we have the, the words to speak in the moment Father, exactly what needs to be said, prompted by your Spirit, so that others may know you and be encouraged by your truth. Thank you, God, that you have included us. God, I bless your people now, Father Lord, with the ability, Father Lord, to love like you, to serve like you, and to speak like you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.